introduction and introduce, that's right, applause. Our next two speakers, we have a tag team coming up. That's right, things are getting more and more exciting. Momentum is building. Jamshid Shorish and Andrew Clark. Dr. Shorish is CEO and founder of Shorish, Re Shorish Research and a senior advisor to the Uberlink Corporation, a technology firm which developed Voson, the virtual observatory for the study of online networks. He also works with the Australian National University's Voson Lab, where Voson is used for research, research tool development, teaching, and training. Andrew Clark is a data economist at Block Science with a background in financial and technology auditing with a focus on building machine learning auditing systems. And together, they will present an empirical study of Filecoin Gas and some ongoing research. I'll turn the mic over to Jamshid and Andrew. Great, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, also to, uh, to ZX and Alex. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, some of the extant work that uh, Block Science has been cooperating uh, with uh, and through the Crypto Econ Lab. Um, my colleague, uh, Andrew, should be online momentarily, but in the meantime, I will go ahead and uh, just kind of give an overview of what it is that we're doing from the block science side of things and how it applies to two extant research directions that we're working on, uh, one of them having to do with the gas dynamics of the Filecoin network, and the other one through a pass-through of a simulation framework that we have uh, into an assessment of a, uh, a particular type of protocol update uh, around the batch uh, batch fee and the batch balancer. Uh, so what we'll be looking at very quickly in our, our time available today is to start with a section on gas dynamics, where we'll be looking at the way in which data was surfaced, how that gas usage was decomposed uh, into its pieces, and then extrapolate using, using that particular decomposition to understand and inform uh, how it is that we can extrapolate forward gas usage given a particular time series of the network. Uh, that in itself is extremely useful for building out a uh, simulation framework that actually goes on a macro level step by step through the Filecoin network and acts as a digital twin. Uh, a digital twin, which is built in the CAD CAD simulation framework at Block Science, uh, is one of the workhorses by which we can understand how, for example, different types of activities that may have occurred or different types of scenarios that we would like to know what might be happening uh, can pass through the network and allow us to have actionable insights. Uh, utilizing both the digital twin and the gas dynamics analysis uh, will then go into a very quick application area, which has to do specifically with the, uh, the batch balancing uh, system, where we'll look at kind of what batch balancing is in a very quick snapshot and then kind of wrap up with extant research on utilizing the, uh, the framework of the digital twin and the gas dynamic systems to move forward into actually selecting among a very large class of possible batch balancing frameworks, uh, one which may meet the criteria that we would like to be most interested in for being able to assess when it is optimal to aggregate uh, different messages and when it is optimal to keep them as separate messages. So that's kind of the overview of what we've got for uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, I'm checking to see now whether or not uh, Andrew is available. I'll do a quick check here. Otherwise, I will jump in and, and take over a section. Ah, he's coming online now. Very good. Okay, Andrew, I'm uh, going to give the floor over to you. I'll continue to drive just in the interest of time to make sure that we have uh, uh, ample time available for the rest of the talk. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Um, so what we started with was, oh, it looks like it's between slides. Oh, perfect. Um, we started with an exploratory data analysis around the gas mechanism to understand kind of how what was driving uh, gas usage and, and gas limits and some other things and understand a lot, a lot of the key components that drive it. Um, we did a lot of different methods and different aggregations, um, you know, do it on blocks or do we did it by seconds, by days, um, and tried to see um, how the how the trends were happening, um, all of that kind of information to, to really understand what the key drivers were. So the types of analysis we we did, if you go to the next slide, please, was also checking the change of of actor methods. We created our own data dictionary based off of what the storage miner five means, for instance. So we went and through the Filecoin code and figured out what those things were, so we could see the percentage change in message counts, for instance, between different times 
Like this right here is a week percentage change between a uh, week of September 2nd, which is an example of this storage miner seven had a massive increase in the number of messages over this course. And we did these types of analyses to really see what we're driving during in combined with macroeconomic variables. We also use things such as Fourier transformation, which is on the right-hand side here, uh, to disaggregate the data into a frequency domain um, and be able to see what the components were and see the trends. So we could start, under, and then we did phase shift analyses and, and things like this, all to try and understand what were the key drivers so we could understand the intuition for building um, predictive models off of the system. So it, as we're gonna get into the digital twin and, and how that whole system works, um, we wanted to make sure that we could understand what the key signals were so we could derive specific models to be more predictive as we get into the system identification, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit for how we're forecasting uh, states forward as the different actors are, are interacting and um, getting very accurate gas usage from the bottom up approach. One of the main techniques we use, if you go to the next slide, please, um, was something called uh, Granger causality, which is a, a very interesting method that, that we used to create our vector autoregression models. By what, what Granger causality does, this allows us to understand if certain variables um, from a VAR model, which is uh, it's just an autoregression model with you determine the number of lags and you can have many different factors. What this heat map shows here on the right is we can determine like at the top here is base fee burn, does that cause um, one of the actor methods to have a higher count? And what Granger causality does essentially is it, it's it's a way of trying to infer the causality of does this variable cause this other variable based on the on the lag from a bar model. So what you can see here is based off the, the p-values and the statistical um, relationships, the green are the variables. If you intersect from uh, the column and row, you can see which variables are, have that factor. So what we were trying to do is based on the, the time period we had, which is one of the key considerations we'll get into in a, in a moment, based on we were using the Sentinel Filecoin database, that is truncated at specific uh, periods of time. Um, so we, don't, we didn't have a massive back history, especially if we're doing daily data for how these different methods classes work. Um, as we're the most likely as we're looking at it, like a, an operational digital twin to drive business insights, we kind of want daily values for these things. Um, we had a dimensionality problem of having way too many um, different uh, actors and their different gas usage. It was way too wide of data for the amount of rows we had. So that's a dimensionality issue where you it's has a very hard time training models. Traditionally, we would use something called a, a VAR max model, where it's the vector autoregression is the endogenous variables. What we're trying to predict would be the gas usage of these different actors methods. Um, and then we pl pull in macroeconomic variables as the exogenous. Um, in this case, the macroeconomics would be, you know, base fee, burn, and some of these, these higher things. If we're trying to predict you know, all the different signals from the Filecoin network, minor penalty, pledges, that kind of thing. All, anything that we think is relevant that we can derive here um, to be able to predict what this gas usage would be. So because we ran into this difficulty, and you can actually see on the left-hand side here, some of our, our plots of the end model we ended up with. We're not going to go into all the specifics of how we have it. We have a little bit more information in the appendix, and we can definitely follow up offline. We use something called a, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, um, of our X model that Dr. Shorsh uh, came up with, is, which is essentially by using this Granger causality, we can understand what the key macroeconomic variables were. And then we ran them as a normal VAR model instead of this normal VAR, VAR max model. And then this allowed us for, based on this analysis as well, we found what were the key drivers, because there's so many different actor method classes, we only need some of them to be doing an, um, you know, Pareto principle for doing an accurate digital twin that's performant. Um, and we can see here, what the different gas usage uh, per day from these different accounts. Um, so we use this, this, this method that was faster, that got around the computational limitations, that allowed us to build this integrated digital twin that allows us to get the previous state and predict the next state from our operational DT. As we were building this out, um, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we started running, oh, um, yeah, that, that works. Uh, we started running into issues as we're building into the digital twin, um, issues with data, uh, long, longitudinal data for back testing and, and things like that nature. Um, and be able to really fully build a model, we needed a longer period of time of the data. Uh, and we were with Sentinel was truncating that data. Um, as the operational digital twin, we, you know, we want to perform health metrics, we want to inform decisions, we want to sanity check behavior, expect behavior, we need a long period of high fidelity data in order to do this. 
Um, and this was the goal of all of that analysis we were building towards was being able to make this gas dynamics for extrapolation digital twin that helps make decisions for, for the Filecoin network and helps doing parameterizations and things. And when we, when we started really taking that initial analysis we did, which we knew we had limitations based on how far we could go back in the data, and then based on what the goals were here, um, if you go to the next slide, please, we created this operational digital twin infrastructure uh, ourselves, where basically what we did here was we went back and got old Lily data fields. We got um, all these different data sources and, and Sentinel um, because we lacked the, the fidelity um, and, and the longitudinal data that we needed for our, our analysis. So there is, uh, a Filecoin did also have an internal research database, but it didn't quite have the right fields and things as the different aggregation layers we're using um, and, and all of the different uh, signals we needed based on our, our EDA analysis of the different macroeconomic signals for the, for, from our VARX analysis with that, that heat map with the, that we showed, we had to build our own internal um, infrastructure, which is now up and running, that, uh, that allows us to basically every night batch data from um, Sentinel after we backfilled with Lily, we then can use Sentinel and then aggregate into our digital twin um, data fields and aggregations we need. So then when we have this operational digital twin that's used by Filecoin stakeholders, they're pulling directly the refined data fields from um, the block science RDS here that's a lot more efficient than trying to ETL and do all of these analyses each time because the code to ETL from the raw Sentinel production parsed messages, for instance, into the, the daily level or epoch level uh, gas usage data that we needed is a long process and takes a long time to run. So we've now ETLed all of that um, here so we can have uh, build this operational digital twin with the health metrics and the ability to do what if analysis and counterfactuals and parameterizations and have that into a, a solid state. So I'll hand over here back to Dr. Shores for, for going forward on talking about how some of the gas dynamics then moved into the batch balancer. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, so what we're gonna look at now is a very quick application of this uh, digital twin infrastructure with the gas dynamics extrapolation exercise built into it uh, in order to understand one particular feature of the, the Filecoin protocol uh, that has the potential for being, uh, for being updated. And so this is an active area of research we're currently working on uh, on actually uh, building out the uh, the functional form representations that we're testing uh, in the digital twin. Uh, just as a quick overview of what the batch balancer is doing, uh, what's happening in this particular environment is, as many of you know, that there is the opportunity for uh, messages to be aggregated uh, or batched in order to be able to, to save gas. And in particular, for the largest gas usage uh, messages of pre-commit and proof commit uh, messages for, um, for the proof of replication. Uh, the intuition is that as the network use becomes high, then batching is incentivized in order to improve efficiency. And uh, the mechanism by which this is being done, which is raised initially in, uh, in FIP 13 and then, uh, and then updated once in FIP 24, um, is to have a batch fee surcharge uh, with two different degrees of freedom, one of which is a batch balancer, which enables individuals to make a trade-off between what the base fee would be for a single message uh, submission and what would be happening if you actually aggregated things together. Uh, and on the other side, a batch discount, which is a way of incentivizing uh, a little bit of a, of a shaving or a little bit of a haircut on that uh, on that surcharge, depending upon uh, how the system is performant. And in these two particular degrees of freedom, uh, what we're going to see is that currently these are being set at once and then updated through governance. And what is being uh, investigated is whether or not we can actually endogenize one or both of these uh, to respond to network conditions. But just to give a very quick idea of what the Filecoin batch balancer would be uh, set up to implement in this particular context, uh, we would have a pool of messages that are coming in from storage onboarding as you want to have these sectors being sealed. Uh, they would come into a batch decision. The question of whether or not to aggregate then depends upon the state of the system at that time, the base fee that is available, and then what the batch uh, balancing surcharge would be. Uh, then there would be a decision on batching or not batching. If you do batch, then you get less gas per message but then you have the batch surcharge, which is applied. Uh, if you do not batch, then you send messages singly. Uh, you have more gas than per message, but then no surcharge. And they lead to different types of outcomes on the, the stress, let's say, of the, of the network. Uh, if you aggregate and batch things at once, then you're able to accumulate, you're able to use less gas and utilize less of the network and there's a lower chance of network congestion. Whereas if you have individual messages that are singly being submitted, uh, if there is already a high level of network utilization, then this will add to the burden to, uh, to congest. And so the idea from the batch balancer is that if you have, for example, high network use, 
than what would be chosen in an environment where the parameters of that batch balancer are already being specified is to say, yes, I would prefer to batch in that situation, collect everything together to sort of use less gas and then lower the network pressure. So this is from the point of view of the network, what would we like to see? And of course we want to ensure that there's an incentive underlying this for the, each of the storage providers to do so. By contrast, if it was in the low network utilization environment, we would say, well, it's not so interesting then to batch. Let's not incentivize batching as much, let individuals use the network as in single messages, and then perhaps raise the network usage. And so we end up with kind of an equilibrating regulator system that's put into place, but it's predicated upon those two degrees of freedom that I mentioned, the batch balancer value and the batch discount. Now, how those are updated presently well, those are updated by governance and by introducing a FIP. So as we move from FIP 13 to FIP 24, uh, what's being introduced is a change to one or both of those parameters on the basis of what has been seen in between the two points at which these have been last updated. So you look over the interval and say, well, maybe it makes sense now that we increase uh, the surcharge by a slight amount, or perhaps we decrease the discount by a certain amount. This is a way in which you can use expert knowledge to drive the update that occurs, but of course it means that you cannot respond in the immediacy of a change in network conditions because you have to wait until you have an appropriate amount of time for review and the FIP to be accepted. So by contrast, the idea here is that the active research we're looking at is to see whether or not we can put into place a, a functional form representation that explicitly depends upon the state of the network and that dynamically adjusts one or both of those parameters. And so if there is actually say high network utilization that this dynamic batch balancer would then take that into consideration and then adjust in total that batch surcharge and influence the incentivization of individual storage providers accordingly. So by introducing a dynamic batch balancer framework, you let's say not necessarily eliminate the need for having uh, governance because you may want to change the form of that particular mechanism, mechan mechanism depending upon its performance, but it does mean that you don't have to change those parameters every single time through a governance process. The regulator system now has been endogenized. So the challenge of course, is to create such a dynamic batch balancer that responds to network behavior autonomously while continuing to incentivize batching for the storage provider when network usage is high. And our current research agenda is to assess a parameterized dynamic batch balancer functional form within the digital twin, the operational digital twin of the Filecoin network that Andrew had introduced. The goals in that case then are to select using the digital twin and understanding different scenarios, a parameterization that is informed by simulations that we engage and employ for various storage onboarding rates or various types of, uh, of demand activities for Filecoin services. And that assists then in the recommendations for a FIP to implement the dynamic batch balancer uh, upon conclusion of those simulations. These are simulations that are ongoing at the moment. And finally, the idea here for the batch balancing is to incorporate all of the information that we can about the existing network. That is to ensure that we understand not just the laws of motion about the system as a whole, but actually to understand what would the system like to have. So we know, for example, from a storage provider's point of view, they want to make a batching decision predicated on cost. But from the network as a whole, optimal batching is predicated upon network efficiency. There's a trade-off between the network becoming too congested on the one side and not having enough of the, let's say, protocol revenue of the, uh, of the gas being burned on the other. So the digital twin implementation allows us to model the entire network as a macro system that selects message batching in a simulated framework based upon network use and the gas usage from message traffic according to this batch balancer functional form. So we dovetail in the gas dynamics on the one side into the digital twin on the other, conditional upon this functional form, examine the scenario simulations that occur, and by using different metrics, assess which one or another parameter constellations are optimal for that particular implementation of the functional form of the batch balancer that we would be suggesting. So by the simulations, we actually look at various storage onboarding scenarios, high storage onboarding, low storage onboarding, high network congestion, low network congestion, to understand that impact of the different message traffic rates. And we combine those scenarios with the gas dynamics laws of motion that Andrew had uncovered in the first part of the talk to be able to run those simulations conditional upon as close to an understanding 
of how those gas dynamics are influencing things like the burn rates for different messages as possible. In order to be able to combine those two together, we then perform what is part of the engineering design work process, a parameter selection under uncertainty to be able to figure out a range usually of parameter values for which the dynamic batch balancer uh, can be then uh, recommended. Okay, I think that's everything that we have the time available. I know we went through fast, uh, fast and furious for different research opportunities, but please uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, naturally, if you want to have any more information, uh, you can definitely contact Block Science and uh, either of us uh, individually. So thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> Thanks to Jamshid and Andrew for a great illustration of the power of the digital twin model for modeling and simulation, and for a nice illustration of the relationship between empirical observation and mechanism design in the Filecoin ecosystem. We have time for a couple of questions to the speakers. I'll run up to you like Oprah. Don't be shy. Okay, I'll get it started then. Uh, I noticed in one slide you made reference to an intuition that you had about the system you were modeling when you were describing, uh, when you're designing the batch mechanism, batching mechanism. Where, um, where do these intuitions come from? Are there any real world or digital systems that you find are fruitful sources of intuition when you're building these kinds of models and when you're doing these kinds of studies? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so some of the kinds of environments that we look at uh, are, uh, are control systems. Uh, whether or not we're looking at open loop or closed loop feedback systems, a feedback system which says that uh, we would like to respond to a particular state of the system by taking an action that reinforces a criteria such as stability or a, a minimal set of volatility. Uh, these become ways in which we can kind of understand the trade-offs that must exist for an individual of their own volition, completely of their own choice, to make decisions that affect the network as a whole in a positive fashion. And so it is, uh, of course, a, a longstanding and open question about whether or not individuals, when doing their own thing, will do things such that they don't end up working against the community as a whole. So there is a lot of tension when you're trying to aggregate up from a micro decision to a macro decision. The idea within the context of the, the batching system is to say, we want to make sure that people understand that they can batch when it suits them at any time, but that we would see on the margin that they would decide to batch more often under conditions which benefit the network, for example, under conditions of high network congestion. There is actually an empirical fact that they, we have individuals who like to batch even when there's absolutely no network congestion. They batch a certain amount all the time, maybe thinking it's just simply an efficiency gain, even though they aren't necessarily earning any kind of savings from this because the network level is so low, the base fee is so low. This may call into question strategic issues of whether or not they are looking forward and saying, oh, maybe I'm actually going to change perhaps my, my impact today changes the base fee in the future. And therefore, when I actually have my time tomorrow to actually engage in message traffic, uh, I actually save money on that. And part of what we're investigating in this macro model is to actually model those types of strategic decisions, uh, which are motivated from game theory, but are built into a, a macro model of the trade-off between the current benefit and the future benefit. So this is one of the ways in which we utilize that, that intuition behind driving the micro level to the macro level uh, to build such systems. Thank you for that. We have another question. What kind of changes to um, the system would make it way easier to measure a lot of the things that you want to measure and make it easier to either run experiments or simulations and so on? I imagine um, a lot of this is sort of rate limited by the ability to like do experiments or um, design diff different kinds of potential systems and so on. Are there any kind of changes that could come into the tech stack itself to make it easier? Um, good question. I, I, and I'll, I'll defer also to, to Andrew if he has an answer to this. From, from my side, it is the more information that you can get ex post about the distributions of things that occur in the system, the better. 
Uh, a lot of the challenge from uh, from the data side is to be able to build, uh, let's say, a, a model of the distribution of the things that you're not totally under your control. So exogenous effects, for example, and the tighter bounds that you can place on that. So the greater the data fidelity is to be able to run some sort of a parametric or non-parametric estimation, uh, the better off you are, because then you can close the error bounds a little bit over a wide range of different simulations that you might have. Uh, but let me also defer to, to Andrew if he wants to add something to that. It's a great question. Yes, completely agree with, with what you just said. The other thing we, we are working on to make it so it is more accessible and easier to use for the analysis on the tech stack is moving it to Docker images because there's, setting this type of thing up is a lot of different dependencies and things. So one of the next steps we have in the operational digital twin is like we have the data already set up in a specific way. We can keep, keep making it so we can do the different distributions and as many ex, uh, in, as many pre-knowledge we have, but also the ability to then run this from a Docker container without the full setup allows us to crowdsource a little bit more some of the analysis versus like if, if we're like, here, here's a repo with all of this code, it's going to take a long time to set that up versus like if you have Docker, we can package all this so then you can go in and change params and do more experimentation. So from a text stack uh, perspective specifically, moving to the, the full digital twin to Docker will definitely an aid the crowdsourcing of, of analysis. Great, thanks. And do we have any other questions to the speakers? Uh -huh. I think in the architecture you showed, like a lot of the data originated in a like Sentinel database, um, Redshift or something. Like, what would be the trade offs if you were sourcing that data from uh, Filecoin or IPFS directly? Or would, yeah, would that help at all or hurt? Mm -hmm. And that's that's the key thing is so we also used a Lily, which is our S it was S3 dumps uh, of, of data from actual Filecoin uh, chain. We used a lot of that as the basis of our backfilling as well. Um, for the digital twin, a lot of times we're looking at, at a little bit more of a an aggregated view than specifically from the chain. And internally at Block Science, we are looking at uh, creating a system where we can basically ETL directly from different blockchains. So at that point, we could actually go from the Ethereum IPFS um, uh, Filecoin system. But for the if we're doing operational DT for making decisions about how to structure the economics, going to that level of fidelity versus relying on like uh, an aggregation that's even epoch level or, or daily or even second level, that kind of data is more what we need for operational DT. So at the moment, it's not going to create a, for the amount of additional work to hit directly from the Ethereum chain is not going to outweigh the costs because of where uh, it's not going to create the benefit based on, on what the aggregated data we need. But definitely is something we're long-term looking towards. The, the closer we can get to the actual data and then have an aggregation layer, the better. And that's a long-term research progress project we're working on across all block science clients. Great. Thanks again to Andrew and Jamshid for that presentation.